I'm going to talk about the Northern Baroque. And I want to talk about two artists who are from Holland and Belgium. Rembrandt is, uh, is from Holland, and originally he was born in a town called Rhine, so he's known as Rembrandt von Rhine. But he made, mainly worked in a, a city called Amsterdam. Vermeer is also uh, from Holland, and he worked in a place called uh, Delft. And uh, the other artist that we're going to talk about is Peter Paul Rubens, who worked uh, mainly in Antwerp, and he is from Belgium. And so remember that the names of those place, places, um, so uh, Belgium is known sometimes as Flanders, and uh, Holland is known sometimes as the Netherlands, because it's the nether region. And we're going to be talking about some similarities and some differences to Caravaggio and Velazquez in terms of their painting styles. And I want you to think that both of these guys are actually sort of Caravaggistes. Peter Paul Rubens is kind of a giant in terms of the things he was able to accomplish with his life and also the kinds of paintings he accomplished. And he is in some ways a lot more like Bernini in terms of his temperament than any of the other artists that we're going to talk about. And what I'm talking about is he was a superb diplomat. He spoke many languages, I think, among them Spanish, French, uh, Dutch, Latin, and probably uh, German as well. And he was actually hired by Henry, the King of France, Henry of Navarre, uh, to uh, be a diplomat who in his diplomatic wanderings, Rubens actually met Velazquez at the court uh, down in, in uh, Spain. So he is this guy who is both a gentleman, a diplomat, uh, a linguist, because he basically spoke a bunch of different languages, and he is also a brilliant painter. And because of all of this, he has a sort of giant status in the history of art, and he's also a very good painter. So if you look at this painting called the, uh, the, the Rape of the Daughters of Lucifus, Rubens is doing some things that Caravaggio does, but not in quite the extreme that we've seen before. So, for instance, in this painting, we don't have uh, extreme tenebrism. There's no real spotlighting effect. It's kind of evenly lit across it. But in terms of the gesture, in terms of how he's painting, there is a, a strong degree of, of sort of Caravaggio-ness to it, um, but he's also, the subject matter of it, is not necessarily a, uh, a, a, a Christian religious scene. It is a classical scene, but it's a classical scene that's probably closer to Anibale Caracci's Farnese ceiling in spirit than it is to one of Caravaggio's or Velazquez's paintings, although Velazquez did some things like this if you look a little deeply into his uh, his body of work. The story that's being depicted here, we'll look at it from an iconographic point of view first, is basically a cheesy mythological story that has to do with sort of sex and violence and, and would appeal to, to a more prurient and uh, dramatic taste. And uh, a painting like this takes mythological themes and sort of uses them as a cover or a disguise for more or less a male fantasy in a way. And the story here has to do with the founding of Rome um, and some of the events that are in the Aeneid and, and also mentioned in the Odyssey from, from Greek mythology and Roman mythology. And there are these two heroes, Castor and Pollux. And Castor and Pollux uh, were basically these two warriors who were born because Zeus has visited Leda um, and uh, he visited her and, and he came in the form of a swan, impregnated her, and then she had laid a golden egg and these two guys popped out. And the two guys who popped out were Castor and Pollux and one was a supreme horseman and the other one was really good with armor and arms. And they were uh, sort of uh, semi-divine guys who were warriors. And <clears throat> they were basically promised these two virgin priestesses, Phoebe and Hilaria, uh, to be their brides. And so when we look at this painting, you can see there's this Arcadian or pastoral landscape that's stretching out behind the scene. And then we see in these various little areas uh, between the horse and, uh, and I believe that's Castor's head, 
um, is, is a uh, cupid sort of holding onto the mane of one of the horses. And in the far left-hand side, we see another cupid. So, of course, this is a love scene in a way, right? And we have um, Castor and Pollux are carrying off these two priestesses. And uh, it looks like they're sort of objecting to it, but not really. So that ties in a little bit with the idea of uh, the male fantasy of being able to carry off a woman and, and uh, make her your own in a way. And, you know... Uh, in a way, this is uh, it's it's a bad lesson if you think about it uh, for male female relationships because it codifies in some way the idea that um, removing a female by force or raping a female is something that the female desires, and we all know that that's not the case. So we have Castor and Pollux carrying off these two females, and these two females have idealized bodies, but idealized bodies in what Peter Paul Rubens thought was an idealized body. And so what we see are very uh, fleshy looking females. Um, they're painted a little bit like the Mannerist females that we saw by Correggio um, when we looked at, for instance, Jupiter and Io. And <clears throat> the male's bodies are very heroically portrayed with large muscles and that kind of thing. And these are typical uh, depictions of the human form by Rubens. And he's actually known for his plump women that are very fleshy and very pale, which corresponds to the look of the females in Antwerp at that point in time, and also to um, the sort of sexy female or the ideal of the female for him at that point in time would have been a well-fed female. And so being um, a little fleshier would have been a positive thing and would have indicated wealth and, and that is in a way a, a trigger for some sort of attraction. <clears throat> now the next thing that I want to approach a little bit more in depth is the fact that Rubens paints this seven feet by ten feet so the size of it is massive and a lot of his paintings, I'm not sure about this one, were made actually in his studio uh, more or less on spec, meaning that you know he'd make a painting and hope that he could sell it. And he had a large studio that worked with him. And so Rubens may have come up with the initial idea and even did a small oil sketch, and we'll look at his oil sketches in a bit. And then he had a studio <clears throat> of people who would actually go in and paint out his ideas, and he would come in and do the final touches on it. So his his studio is actually a really um it's like a workshop almost like uh how movies are made today where he, he would compartmentalize and he would have certain people who would paint certain things so he might have someone who was really good at painting horses he might have someone who was really good at painting hands and bodies uh and and another guy was good at painting faces and landscapes something like that and he would have these guys work on his painting and then he would come back in and add the final touches and oversee it almost like a director in a film and so this is one of those paintings and it kind of has almost a cinematic look to it the other thing about this painting in terms of its iconography is probably that it relates to male fantasies in a way and uh <clears throat> when i was in graduate school i actually read some books that were about the depiction of females, especially in pornography. And uh, one of the suggestions of image types and the kinds of fantasies that men find erotic in, uh, in pornography often is the lesbian scene. And one of the, uh, the books that I read actually talked about lesbian scenes as a way of sort of showing both sides of the female figure and often not including the male figure in them. And I think in this painting, that's kind of the case. The men are almost secondary. And we have a front view and a back view of a female body. And that's really made for the male gaze, the male point of view, and for male pleasure to look at the female body unobstructed by uh, another figure of a male figure. In this case, if you think about it, uh, the horses are almost like the backdrop behind it, and the women are the most visible things. If you blur your eyes a little bit, they actually stand out the most. And it's in a way, their bare flesh is almost a tenebrism, in a way, a spotlighting effect. So Rubens does these things where he is making paintings for an audience that he knows will understand classical references and will understand that these classical references are a form of disguise for what he actually wants to say or show people. And so in this way, he was also diplomatic in providing for the needs of his male viewers. Since Rubens was a diplomat, 
he also worked for Marie de Medici. And of course, remember, he worked for Henry Navarre. And uh, there's a bit of a, a story about Henry Navarre and Marie de Medici. Henry Navarre was basically the king of France. And in a diplomatic uh, mission, he arranges to marry one of the Medici daughter, daughters, Marie de Medici. And he has her brought up from Italy to France. And interestingly enough, um, he marries her, and we'll see this in another painting by proxy. It's almost as if he couldn't be bothered to, to, to be there. And so after Henry Navarre's death, he is uh, his wife, who is still around, Marie de Medici, and might have even had a hand in his, in his demise, was uh, decided to hire Rubens to commemorate the marriage and the unification of the Catholic uh, interests with the Northern French interests. And part of the unification um, between the Medici family and the Navarre uh, of the North, the French, is basically a, a political decision to make sure that Catholicism can remain in power. Now, at one point there is actually uh, some issues with Calvinism and uh, Protestantism, uh, Lutheranism in France. And there is pressure for Henry to, to remove um, the dissenting uh, people of the, of the Protestant groups from France. And that goes back and forth. And at one point, uh, um, Protestantism is legalized and there's, there's tolerance for it. And then at other points, it's reversed, especially when we come across Louis XIV later on. But in this instance, we have this unification of Catholic Italy with Catholic France, and it's and it's really a, a wedding of politics rather than a wedding of any kind of affection or love. But it was commemorated by de Marie de Medici in a series of paintings after Henry's death, and I think that there are something in excess of, of um, 15 paintings in the series, and uh, most of them are in the Louvre right now. And they were painted within the course of uh, really just about three to five years, all of those paintings were completed by Rubens' studio. And they all commemorate different events in the uh, wedding, and it's almost like a comic strip or a comic book of it. So we have here the arrival of Marie de Medici at Marseille, and she is getting off of the boat, and above her, you can actually see a sort of winged victory figure, we call them Nike or Nike figures, blowing a trumpet. On the, uh, behind her on the ship is this sort of Roman triumphal arch that is the ship itself. Underneath that, you can actually see there are these sort of caryatid carvings that are on the ship. As she walks down the ramp, she's being greeted by a guy wearing the basically the clothing of a Roman soldier. And uh, he has a helmet that, that looks like a classical Roman uh, soldier's helmet. And above him is a canopy with the same sort of emblem that you see on his cape. And that emblem is the fleur-de-lis, which is the flower of Louis which is an emblem of French power. And as we move down the picture plane and we see Marie de Medici sort of being uh, escorted uh, into Marseille to, to take on the mantle of being the, uh, basically the queen of France, underneath we see that the ship that she had taken from Italy to France was being escorted by Poseidon and a bunch of sea nymphs. And uh, the sea nymphs look a lot like Phoebe and Hilaria from the, uh, the painting we looked at above. The, the, the daughters of Leucippus, and their legs terminate actually in octopus tentacles, and, uh, and they are actually sort of sea nymphs. And again, we get to see um, the front and the back of the, of the female form and heroicized male figures. So what Rubens is kind of doing is he's using classical um, iconography and symbols, classical stories and myths, to ratify and to give some authority to current events from his time period. And so what, when you really think about this, this is the beginning of sort of current, current events painting that will evolve later on into something we call history painting. If you were to compare the two paintings, what you really see is Rubens kind of has a theme running through most of his work. The theme has to do a lot with referencing classicism and heroicizing the figures, 
but also at the same time working with an audience that would understand those themes that is sort of an upper class audience, a, a, a royal audience and people who are very moneyed and wealthy. And he makes these paintings usually on a monumental scale. And they're usually to reinforce the ideology of the people who were in power at that time. So for instance, we have in the right hand side, the uh, arrival of Marie de Medici is a way of ratifying or, or uh, idealizing in some way and giving authority to the role of Marie de Medici as the Queen of France. And the left hand side, in some ways, I don't mean to be too snarky about it, but it really ratifies and gives authority to the male point of view of the female body. Now I did mention to you that the way that Rubens worked was he would make a small model or a modello uh, for the paintings and what I wanted to do was just give you a chance to take a look at how he would work. And the way that uh, Rubens worked was very similar in that a la prima method that I discussed with you before that um, Caravaggio worked in. And basically what the alla prima method is, is that you start with a coating of a brown paint, usually either burnt sienna or burnt umber. And then you just draw with the brush in darker colors, for instance, darker burnt umber over a sort of lighter burnt sienna background. And you work up the drawing so that it's almost like a sketch. And then for, in this instance, in this model, he actually uses, instead of using blue, he uses gray because in the midst of all of that warm brown, the gray that he's painting with appears to look like it's blue and he uses that in the sky and he uses it in the cape. This painting would have been pretty small, probably no larger than 16 by 20 inches or something like that. And the painting that it would have been transformed into by his studio was about 10 feet tall and there were many in the sequence. And so we see um, a sort of production line assembly where he does the planning drawing, which is actually a planning painting, and then he uses that painting to give to his studio, and his studio workers actually develop the larger work from it. Here are another two paintings in the series, and I just thought it would be kind of a nice way of uh, showing some other things that Rubens did in terms of this large monumental series. And if you get a chance and you're in the Louvre, go visit the room that all these paintings are in. And more or less, the one on the left actually shows uh, Juno, who uh, is one of the goddesses presenting uh, a portrait of Marie de Medici to Henry. And in the sky above, we have Hera and, uh, um, and Jove or Zeus and, and Hera uh, presiding over the, the heavenly event and uh, there's a symbol of Hera with the eyes in the, in the peacock feathers. And we have this winged victory figure presenting this painting to Henry and Henry seems to approve. And we have uh, you know, Juno more or less saying, this is gonna be a great marriage. And then we have these angels who are actually little cupids underneath um, sort of saying, wow, this is gonna be a great wedding or great marriage. In the painting on the right-hand side, it's the next scene in the series, and the, uh, the painting actually represents Marie de Medici getting married off-site, not in Paris. I think, I can't remember where she stopped off, but <laughs> he, uh, Henry sent a proxy person. So, you know, sometimes when you vote, uh, for instance, uh, if you belong to AAA or something like that, they send out little letters that allow you to vote by proxy by hiring someone else to vote for you or, or giving authority. Uh, sometimes you see that even in um, big companies will have a proxy, uh, someone who sits on the board for you and will vote for you in your place. And so in this case, we have Marie de Medici getting married and there's a proxy standing in for her. And we've got this sort of like little Cupid figure holding a, a, a torch and, um, and we have a, uh, a Catholic, I believe that's a, a bishop, uh, marrying the two of them. And then at the base of the picture, interestingly enough, we have got this little dog that is supposed to represent fidelity, uh, who is sort of there to, to ratify the event. <laughs> 